Okay, hello everybody. I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Summers and I'm the Program Development Specialist with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. And I am hosting this uh, seminar today. And this is the first seminar in our Celebrating 50 Years of Excellence, UWSP's College of Natural Resources Spring Seminar Series. So um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to everybody who has helped put this seminar series together. Uh, this is hosted primarily by the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife and the College of Natural Resources. And I'd particularly like to say thank you to Stacy for her help in, in co-organizing this seminar series in contacting uh, speakers and, and so on. Um, she has been invaluable to making the series possible and other folks in the CNR as well. And I'd also like to thank the CNR faculty and the discipline coordinators, the four for uh, helping us contact speakers and helping us identify speakers. Um, all these folks have been extremely helpful um, to uh, the seminar series becoming a reality. So we have a agreement with the local tribes at, in Wisconsin. Um, we recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. So this is uh, the first of our series. And I just wanted to note that we have seven total uh, speakers in this seminar. And so this is the first and we have, the next one is also next week, Thursday at, um, at 5 p.m. And the final one is gonna be on April 9th on a Friday at 5 p.m. So you can see our website for more information, which is at uwsp.edu slash WCW. And now I'd like to turn it over to our Dean Brian Sloss to say a few words about our 50th anniversary. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, just, I lost my words here. Good afternoon and thank you everyone for attending our kickoff presentation for our Spring Wisconsin Center for Wildlife Colloquium Series. What a strange and wild trip this school year has been and 2021 is at least starting out better than 2020 ended, so we're on track. I'm Brian Sloss, Dean of the College of Natural Resources. I am here today to welcome you and kick off this colloquium. In this spring series, you will hear from several of our alumni, alumni that are proud of their CNR heritage and alumni that we are certainly proud to call our own. Thank you for attending today and thank you, Scott, Jennifer, and all the partners in the college that have organized this great colloquium for us this year. But first, you don't get rid of me that easy, a little history. 75 years ago, Fred Schmeekley and others established the nation's first conservation education major at what was then known as the Wisconsin State Teachers College at Stevens Point, a small regional campus often referred to as Central State. Lee Sherman Dreyfus took over as university president, a role that is currently consistent with our chancellor in, in our campus. And with the help and partnership of numerous faculty, staff, and federal, state, and local officials, oversaw a large number of innovative, driven, and visionary developments on our campus that have stood the test of time and continue to drive us to national recognition. In 1970, shortly after seeing a merger of the former UW system and the Wisconsin State Teachers College system, resulting in our campus current name of UW Stevens Point, President Dreyfus established two professional study colleges on our campus, the College of Professional Studies and the College of Natural Resources. The CNR was established as its own profession focused college because President Dreyfus recognized the critical demands and responsibilities of our graduates in addressing the state and nation's rapidly deteriorating environmental condition. Now remember, this was pre-Clean Water Act in a period of time when it was not unheard of for rivers to literally burn. And in the midst of the Clean Air Act implementation and, and the nation's drive to reach targeted standards by 75, the Endangered Species Act wasn't even in existence. It was three years away from establishment. To say President Dreyfus's timing was impeccable would be a gross understatement. The president stressed the responsibility for our environmental and conservation future. And I quote, this justifies and requires the kind of status and support we are giving it as a separate and autonomous college, speaking of our CNR. 50 years later, I believe he and all of our founders would be proud of what we've all become. The CNR today is comprised of five disciplines, one department, 140 plus faculty, staff, and staff, excuse me, 1,500 plus students, 
and more than 13,000 alumni, the mythical CNR Mafia. The measure and best gauge of our program is and always has been our students and alumni. Generations of faculty and staff have consistently and proudly produced the best damn natural resource and conservation professionals and paper and chemical engineers in the world. As we drive onwards to 100, I can't wait to see where we stand in 25 more years. Because to be honest, I probably won't be here in 100. And the innovation and leadership that our faculty, staff, students, and alumni will provide as we continue to face the conservation and environmental and social and global challenges of the 21st century. Jim, thank you for being our initial speaker in this series. And thank you for everyone for attending. Take care and stay healthy. Now, Shelly, if you'd like to take a moment to introduce Jim. Yeah, I'm so excited. This is the, the, the man that we're, that we're talking about here. Um, Jim Heffelfinger, dear friend of mine, worked together back, gosh, in the early 2000s. I hate to date us like that, Jim. But he is the wildlife science coordinator for the Arizona Game and Fish Department and received his undergrad degree from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, and then a master's in Texas from Texas A&M Kingsville. Um, he's a full research scientist in the School of Natural Resources and Environment at the University of Arizona in um, Tucson, where, where he lives. And he's the chairman of the Mule Deer uh, Working Group, um, sponsored by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency. He has, he has over 30 years um, working on wildlife management. But the reason that I wanted to introduce him was not only to, to talk about all of his accolades, but to give you a few, um, a little information about who Jim really is as well. Um, he is a, an avid hunter and he's also a snake wrangler, as you can see in this picture. But even just yesterday, he had to get a snake out of his own house that was um, not really all that well received by his lovely wife, Annette, who he met in high school. Uh, and the two of them have four uh, sons, the oldest of which is finishing um, his PhD also on, on deer down in Texas. Um, Jim almost sat on a rattlesnake during one of his hunts down in Southern Arizona. <laughs> he also received a commendation of excellence along with Paco Abarca um, last year, at the end of last year um, from the Arizona Game and Fish Department for their outstanding efforts to assist in Mexican wolf recovery. Um, the other thing, the last thing I wanna, I wanna stress is that um, when I was working with Jim at, at Arizona Game and Fish, they didn't have a wildlife science coordinator. It's because Jim was the one who made up his own job, which is pretty, you must be pretty important and pretty well respected to just say to your boss, hey, I really think we need to do this, this job and I think I should be the person to do it. And I think that really, encompasses all that Jim um, provides for wildlife management uh, nationwide in, in that um, they, they trusted him to make up his own job. So with that, um, I think we can hand it off to, to Jim Heffelfinger and thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate that. You know, I have most capabilities and so I was, I have the capability of muting, muting you. I, was, <laughs> I didn't have to use that, that capability. That's good. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I really enjoyed um, working with Shelly when she was with Arizona Game and Fish. And, and I'll try to make this short because it's 72, 73 degrees and sunny today. And I'm wearing my pointer sweatshirt and it's getting kind of warm. So I'll maybe race through my thoughts. So as you probably looking at the screen can guess, that uh, picture on the left is me on graduation day. Um, and the picture on the right is when I returned to Point as distinguished uh, alumnus. I wanted to name the talk um, from dumbass to distinguished alumnus, but they didn't think that was maybe an appropriate title to, to advertise um, all over. But the point of the talk, I want people to know that if right now in their college career, they're identifying a little bit more with the person on the left, um, fear not. With uh, a lot of hard work, you can overcome if you're not the, the leader in your class and have not been academically at the top of your class, there's a lot you can do with hard work and, and perseverance in, in a lot of places. And that's what's taken me throughout uh, my, my career. So let's start out talking about my point days. And that's not a misprint. Um, that pretty much describes some of my time at Stevens Point. We decided that if we never took our cases back to the brewery for uh, deposit, 
we could turn our two bedroom apartment into a three bedroom apartment just by building walls with uh, the point cases and it was uh, it was pretty effective so we had um, a lot of fun at point we worked really hard at point i i spent Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night in the library until the wee hours, studying hard, blocking things out, and then spent Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night down at the square when the square used to be pretty much solid bars down there. And, and I had a late birthday, so I came to college at 17 years old, only needed to use a fake ID for a couple months until I hit 18, which was the, the drinking age at that time. So we, we went out to Schmeekley Reserve, like you see here, sometimes under the cover of darkness. Uh, one night bringing back some cut red pine logs. I don't know what they were in there cut for, but we built red pine bunk beds in Prey Sims dorm with some rope and red pine logs, which you can kind of see in the upper photo a little bit uh, above my, my head. That's what CNR uh, majors do, I guess. But a lot of hard work and, um, and, and a lot of fun to point. I have fond memories. So before Treehaven, we had the summer camp in, in Climb Lake where they let us dig pits to define soil horizons, and they let us log through uh, marshes. But that that summer camp at that time, and probably still today, really set Stevens Point up above, uh, head and shoulders above other natural resource universities, because we were out there doing a ton of things in water and wildlife and forestry and soils, and really getting a, a holistic background in natural resources. So even if you were a wildlife major, you came out with a lot of uh, forestry knowledge and a lot of soil knowledge. And, a lot of that stuff has carried through through my whole um, career for a long time. You can also see that um, today isn't the first time that foam printed trucker hats and, and flannel shirts are in style. We, we had that going uh, a long time ago. But I, I also volunteered a lot. I tried to get involved as a student into everything I could. This was a reptile show we had in the library, um, but whether it was, uh, it was some of the sturgeon patrols or furry chicken surveys, all of that stuff is available to students to get involved in, in the CNR. And all of that stuff helps you meet other people in agencies, meet other people that are in your profession or related professions. And, and if you're a student, you need to be involved in everything you possibly can uh, as you go through. So before there was the Wilder Society, the national TWS meeting with the Quiz Bowl, we had little regional conclaves. And, and this was one that was a Midwestern conclave where we won the the uh, quiz bowl, even before we had these uh, national quiz bowls. And the funny thing was that all the other teams at Purdue University and all these other universities all had matching team shirts and matching t-shirts. And we slogged up there with uh, boots and flannel shirts and, and uh, beat them all. Um, that, was 19, that was 1986. So I graduated, um, surprisingly, in, in four years. And um, I, I just want, I want students to know, if you, if you don't know what imposter syndrome is, you should Google that. I want people to know that when I was an undergrad, I just thought, I don't know if I'm smart enough, I don't know if I'm good enough to ever really be a professional wildlife biologist. But if all else fails, if I can just get a degree, no one can take that away from me. I can always say I have a degree in wildlife, even if I'm bagging groceries, I thought that would be an accomplishment. And, and I was really a little apprehensive about whether I had what it took to just be a, a wildlife biologist somewhere. There wasn't many jobs at that time. So we graduated. And we took all of our um, cases and took them down to the brewery and got our deposits back finally and took that money and bought more beer and bought rocks and went down to Ducal Park and had a big um, graduation party. And after graduation, then I worked for a summer in, in, with the Fish and Wildlife Service in Upper Source National Wildlife Refuge, just as a, a summer technician, working mostly with waterfowl. And it's at that point that I realized just how disgusting birds are and realized that's really not where it's at. And, and tried to focus the rest of my career with mammals, which mammals, mammals rule, of course. Uh, I couldn't find a job anywhere, but I found a, a graduate position that was open in South Texas, looking at coyote predation on mature white-tailed bucks. And so for lack of a job, I went to, to graduate school, still not sure if I was really, uh, had the muster and had what it took to get through graduate school. You can see I brought some furniture with me from um, my Stevens Point days, but I uh, had a great time in, in South Texas and got a master's degree working on predation issues and stayed in South Texas as the manager of uh, wildlife operations for uh, a pretty high-end ranch in South Texas. But after a year or so, just not real enamored with working for a millionaire. I just really wanted to work in a legitimate job with the university or a federal agency 
And so I, I took a job as a research technician at Mississippi State University and, and set about for about a year and a half just capturing deer and radio collaring deer for a statewide study. So it, it involved sitting in a tree stand with a dart gun, basically, and hunting deer and shooting in the buck with a uh, dart and slapping radio collars on them. So this, this launched a, um, an important statewide research project, but also I was, um, I was yearning to working for an, an agency um, somewhere. And after a short stint with the BLM, about three months at uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico, Arizona Game Fish called me up and they said, we've got this regional biologist position in southeastern Arizona, and you'll be managing bighorn sheep, pronghorn antelope, black bears, mountain lions, javelina, a few elk, white-tailed deer, mule deer, three species of quail, um, goose turkeys, and doing telemetry work, doing helicopter surveys, doing plane surveys, assisting on some research projects, and and um, I absolutely said, sign me up. I was I was doing some pretty boring stuff with the Bureau of Land Management in New Mexico. And I spent 23 years in southeastern Arizona as a, as a regional biologist. And it was a it was a fantastic job. I ran years and years of check stations, quail check stations, elk check stations, javelina, deer, collecting harvest data that we then use, harvest data with that survey data to make hunt recommendations and to manage the game population. So my focus was, uh, was game management and had to tranquilize a few errant mountain lions that were not in places where they should have been, like on top of a palm tree or in someone's screened in front porch and, and letting those go. So a lot of really interesting things. One, one thing that happened about halfway through my career as a regional biologist was a local desert bighorn sheep population contracted two diseases from some domestic goats. And we went in there with a helicopter and we captured those six sheep, bighorn sheep, and medicated them and we recaptured and we put radio collars on so we could relocate them we recaptured those six sheep every two weeks and medicated them and and saved a lot of those from some coming from, from those those diseases and so that was that was a helicopter dropping us off without landing and then hovering over the blind animal because they had infectious carotid conjunctivitis in the eyes and they were blind and with that rotor noise we could then sneak up and just basically tackle this uh, bighorn sheep medicate it and then um, let it go on the on the spot. And like I say, we reduced the mortality dramatically in this little isolated uh, population of sheep. So I've got to uh, interact with a whole bunch of different interesting critters. Um, my my kids tell me that I go way overboard with the selfies. But if you've got a baby otter in your hand, what do you do? You do a selfie. I mean, I don't I don't know what else you can you can do, or a or a snake selfie, removing a snake from the from the game of fish parking lot. And as I, as I got more involved in committees and I wrote about things and I read a lot more and just involved in more things along my career, I, I began to get knowledge in certain areas that, that I was getting invited to national and international meetings, speaking in Mexico, speaking in Canada, uh, even speaking in front of up on Capitol Hill in front of uh, uh, congressional staff and, and um, Congress people and senators on big game migrations in the, in the West. So, the person sitting in the um, in the foreground of that lower picture with the gray jacket is Simon Roosevelt. He's a great grandson of, of Theodore Roosevelt, which I actually know from my Blue Crockett dealings. Um, but you get to meet some interesting people. You get to travel to some very interesting places and do interesting things. And, and all of that comes from not just sitting in your seat and checking email all day, but but reaching out, doing more than you have to do, <clears throat> and just working hard and doing a lot of uh, doing a lot of extra things that. That people don't expect you to do. Also, uh, I led the, the Gould's turkey restoration in southeastern Arizona. Gould's turkey is a special subspecies that's mostly in Mexico. It was historically in the American Southwest. And uh, I led a group of people. They did most of the work, but I've kind of orchestrated the activities of where we were going to capture turkeys from and, and where we can release them in, in vacant habitat. And we now have turkey populations distributed in all of that native habitat in the Sky Island, we call them, in southeastern Arizona. And when we started hunting them in a, a kind of a, a very restricted lottery style draw where you had to, in a lottery, get a tag for it, I was able to get one of the early tags and, and actually took a ghoul's turkey with the same shotgun that my great grandfather Frank shot that nice brace of cottontails on his, on his Illinois farm over 100 years before that. So it was special in, in a number of different ways. May not be a lot of people that know who Jack Hanna was. He was, a, or is, he was, a, he was pretty famous to earlier generations as a, a wildlife guy. I was never a huge fan because I thought he was kind of a goofball. 
And when he came to film uh, one of our Bighorn sheep ranch locations from one mountain range to the other, his production crew wanted one person from our agency to be his handler during the day and explain everything to him. And um, so he didn't have to talk to a lot of different people and they selected me. And after that day, I was a huge fan of, of Jack Hanna and his wife Susie. They were, they were hilarious. We laughed all day long. And I, I found out uh, afterwards that they didn't select me because of my scientific knowledge. They, his production crew actually specifically asked for someone with a sense of humor. And now in retrospect, I see why that was because we laughed all day long. We, we, had, a, we had a great time. So I also, for a good part of my career, for 20 years, I've been a member of the Mule Deer Working Group. And for the last 15 years, I've chaired it. And the Mule Deer Working Group is one Mule Deer expert from each of 24 Western states and Canadian provinces and territories. So every place with Mule Deer in, in North America, in those jurisdictions, there's an expert. And they sit on this working group. And I've chaired that working group. And we've done, uh, we, we work, meet a couple times a year, and we, we just work on all kinds of Western Mule Deer issues. A lot of those cross species boundaries and they're, they're pertinent to other species. But through the last 20 years, we've produced uh, just a ton of information for practitioners on the ground, habitat guidelines, energy development guidelines, how to monitor populations, just information about predation and winter kill and, and um, all sorts of things like that. So the group has been very effective and we answer then, I, I report on our progress to all of the Western directors for all the Western Game and Fish Agency in Canada and, uh, and the US. That's been a a really rewarding part of my job. Also for the last 10 years, I've been the department's lead for Mexican wolf recovery planning. We have biologists on the ground that capture wolves and do all the fun stuff. I've been involved in writing, helping write the recovery plan and being involved in these international meetings and, and like the one you see there. And when we go to Mexico, I, I, before COVID, I go to Mexico about two times a year and work with colleagues and, and friends in Mexico. And when we go to Mexico, it's no fun. It's work, it's work, it's work. We sit in these rooms and we work and, and it's all work and no play. Whoops, how did that slide get in there? Um, no, I want you to remember this slide later when I'm talking about collaboration and relationships because conservation happens because of individual relationships that you have with colleagues and with friends. And we have some friends and colleagues. I can't even say the word colleagues without adding friends because they really are more friends and colleagues in, in Mexico that we worked with for about five years now. And we've done some amazing things. We just accomplished amazing things by pooling all of our collective uh, knowledge and skills together. And, and it all starts with um, some beer. You now it all starts with good relationships and often alcohol is, is involved there. The picture in the lower right with the red table, I laugh when I see that picture because we flew into Mexico City and we went and had tacos and we were um, having a few beers for a few hours and then most everybody was done with their beer, except I didn't realize I have it to about three quarters of a beer. And Alejandro stood up because he thought everybody was leaving. And then he saw that I had beer and he sat back down. He said, sorry, sorry, I thought we were ready to go. And I said, yeah, that's no problem. I'm from Wisconsin. And I chugged the beer. And those guys still laugh at that to this day. We'll get together and have a beer. And someone will say, I'm from Wisconsin. And then they pretend like they're chugging a beer. And so it's a big, uh, it, 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 it's just a, a, a a huge joke among us and it's an example of the kind of relationships that you really need to have for effective collaborative conservation like that you need to be on on a schedule like that with with people and i get to go out and, and help the real biologists sometimes and capture and, and release uh, wolves i'm used to capture releasing ungulates where you unhobble them and you take the blindfold off and then you, you make sit there next to them and we released a wolf one night and genevieve the, the main biologist was next to me and we took the blindfold off and we took the leg hobbles off and she backed up about five steps and i was there on my knees next to the wolf in the dark not thinking anything of it and then i realized what am i doing i'm kneeling next to a wild wolf we just captured and, and re-releasing but it was the ungulate biologist in me that was thinking it's nothing no big deal you just release animals and the wolf turned around and looked at me right in the eyes about 18 inches away from my face and, and i got up and he got up and, and we um we parted ways so don't take a deer biologist to a wolf capture. The funny thing is I didn't get bit by a wolf, but about three weeks later, I was on a deer capture in Texas and a deer bit through my fingernail and absolutely crushed my whole fingernail from the nail bed. So there's a lesson there about what animals you need to worry about. So whenever I get a talk in, in public, there's a couple of people that line up and they all have the same question. How can I be a wolf biologist? But I don't think they understand what being a wolf biologist is really, really like. It's not about capturing wolves and having fun. It's 
it's mostly about um, a lot of the other stuff and making sure that there's good solid science behind recovering controversial carnivores like that. So also when, you, um, when you're around, you write a lot of things, you read a lot of things, you're involved in a lot of different things, you, you get taps to come and talk about some of those topics that you were involved in. And I've got a lot of friends that have uh, TV shows and podcasts and they've been involved a lot in outreach messaging about all kinds of, of interesting things that people are interested in. So I, I spent a lot of time doing some of that outreach, even though it's primarily part of my job, primarily my job is science. But when you've got the content that people are interested in, they want to talk to you about um, those sorts of things. So I spend I spend some time doing that. Also, Shelly mentioned I'm, I've been adjunct professor at U of A for 20 years. And five years ago, we developed a new position called Wildlife Science Coordinator. And with that new position, I then moved my office to the University of Arizona. And I'm embedded uh, on campus in the School of Natural Resources and Environment, along with all the other faculty. They built a new building for us where everybody had offices. And they made all of the offices completely glass fronted. So the whole front of the office is, is pure glass. So as you walk down the hallway, you have all of these offices with glass. And someone remarked how much it looked like the primate house when you walk down the, uh, the, the middle aisle. And, and so I got an appropriate, I thought, name tag. And I put a fake tree in there. And I've got a laptop for enrichment, and so on, all set. But it does look like the primate house um, when you walk down. So uh, honored to be a distinguished uh, alumnus a few years ago and come back to Stevens Point. Really, uh, really appreciate that. I was, I was shocked that um, someone that was sitting around in flannel shirts and boots and Prey Sims Hall um, would one day be riding a parade float for homecoming past Prey Sims waving at people. It was kind of surreal. So th as, as interesting and as neat as this was, probably more interesting was to find out that Buffy's Lampoon is still open and the same guy still runs that bar, that was our go-to bar where we spent a lot of time in. So I went and uh, had, a, had a beer with him. And, and that was, uh, it might be disrespectful to say that was the highlight of the trip, but it was, it was pretty exciting to see Buffy still. I still have my Buffy Lampoon uh, t-shirt in, in my closet, believe it or not. So I wanted to impart some things today that if I could go back and talk to this guy when he graduated from Stevens Point, what are some, some shortcuts, some career hacks I could tell myself that would make my career a whole lot easier and, and flatten that learning curve up. So I'm gonna go through the top 10 career hacks that young wildlife professionals in college or, or recently in college should think about um, that I think will help you be more successful in the future. And, and so one of them is you have to have a calendar and a to-do list. Um, so you've gotta have a calendar to track your deadlines. You've gotta have a to-do list to capture everything that needs to be done. And with that to-do list, then you can then prioritize uh, the most important things and do those in order. And I know some, some young professionals that don't run a calendar and a to-do list. And, and I don't know how they keep track of things. You're, you're not gonna be successful unless you can manage those two things. Really important thing for me is how people disagree professionally with me. Disagree in a very agreeable way. And that, that's one of the most important measures for me of how professional a person is. If I'm disagreeing with someone over just a professional issue, over some management action, and they're getting personal and they're getting snarky, that just to me is childish and immature and, and unprofessional. And so you're dealing with other professionals that should always be um, just that professional. And, and an example is in the wolf world, uh, there's a lot of disagreements. And I've been in, in meetings where I'll sit for three hours in a conference room and argue about a professional point with another person. And in one of those cases, we took a break and, and I went back to the coffee pot. The guy I was arguing with most of the morning uh, went back to the coffee pot. He got there first, not that it was a race, but he gets there first and starts pouring coffee. And you could stand there and awkwardly wait for the coffee, but I didn't. I, I, I knew that he had some back problems. And I said, how's your back doing? I know you've got some back problems. And he said, well, I've been riding a bike lately and it's been aggravating it. And on the flight here, I had to lay down on the aisle and the, and the, on the plane just because it hurt so much. And 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 so you know, I saw you know, it's too bad you ever get a like a shot in the back. We're having this normal conversation, and as we're talking, he's pouring my coffee, and then we go back to the table and then we argued with each other for another three three hours. And and that's an example. That's a real life example of exactly how you need to deal as a professional with disagreements. 
you don't you don't disagree you disagree with the person's position you don't get first on and, and um, dislike the person so work ethic have some and that's it that's the only bullet on the slide work hard um, you can just sit and not do anything extra and check email all day long and you're not going to accomplish a lot in, in your career but work work hard what extra things can you do to improve how you do business or, or your job or better inform your administration and, and those sorts of things. So work hard, keep her moving. Hopefully there's some Charlie Barron fans uh, here, but it's really important that you don't just say, well, I have this report to work on. So I'm gonna check email and when all my emails check, then I'm gonna work on this report. You should go into the office and say, okay, I'm with, I need about four hours probably to finish this report. So I'm gonna not check my email until afternoon and I'm gonna work from eight until noon on this report and I'm going to get it done by noon. Set some goals, set some finish line, and keep your eyes on finishing. Don't just go in and think about working on stuff. Think about how much, when you're going to get done and, and just keep projects moving and move through. Skepticism is huge. Early in my career, I was lucky enough to have a couple old curmudgeons and they were skeptical about everything. They questioned things that I just assumed were self-evident. I thought everybody knew it and they would question it and they would, they would force me to, to back up things that I said. And some of the things that I was saying, I found that there isn't really a lot of evidence for that. And, and forcing me to be skeptical about things I read turned out to be a fundamental thing in, in my career. And there's so much bad information in the peer reviewed literature. <clears throat> and, and students have to realize that you can't just repeat everything that you hear. And, and, I, and I see people in agencies and academia they just read something and, and they're not even skeptical of it. They may have some pretty obvious flaws and they're not even skeptical to just repeat what they read. And so uh, question the authority, question everything. Even, even the experts, when you ask them a question, sometimes have wrong answers. That's the way it is. Now, never burn bridges when you're, when you're early in your career, when you're um, first starting out, the person in the cubicle next to you is really annoying. You really don't want to work with them. Um, that person that's annoying in the cubicle next to you someday is probably going to be running your agency or is going to be in a position where they're going to be signing you or they're going to be on a, a selection committee for a job that you really want. I've seen so many times where in the past someone ruined a relationship with someone and then found out later in their career that really hurt them. I've got, I've got personal friends that have missed career, huge career opportunities and even have been taken out of positions just because of things that happened, personal things that happened with individuals in the past. So don't burn bridges, maintain a, a professional relationship. I've seen paybacks and paybacks are uh, bitter when they come back to bite you. N number seven, check high and low. This uh, will save you a lot of grief in your career and you've probably experienced it already. I have some um, examples, which I'm glad we don't have time to go through. But this is when you're forwarding an email and or you're replying all, you look high and you look low. You look up high and you see and make sure you know who that's going to. You look low and you find what in that long email chain below that email that you're dealing with, what's lurking down there? Because you're probably forwarding something to your director about this top email and down at the bottom, there's someone talking nasty about your director or some kind of uh, initiative that he's starting. So, be very aware about who it's going to and what you're sending. So I I'm do I do so much on the phone. I mean, with an email, I'm, I'm, I scroll up, I look who's on the top, I scroll down, I make sure I know what's lurking down there. And it sounds like an extra couple steps, but if you start doing it early, I don't even notice it anymore. It's just a, it's just a matter of um, how I send messages when, when I'm on my phone and, and on the computer. And the earlier you can implement that, um, I guarantee I'll save you some also related to that you don't put anything in an email that you wouldn't want to show up in a newspaper you wouldn't want to show up in the hands of some radical environmental group um, or on a powerpoint presentation i had a quote one time that was in an email that i saw in a public presentation up in some of the powerpoint luckily they put the initial jh and everybody was absolutely convinced 100 that that was john Hanna, another biologist in another region um, so I didn't really take the fall for that, but it was kind of a wake-up call that anything you put in an email just to another coworker, 
can be requested very easily with a letter from uh, anybody. Reporters can request it. And so don't put anything that you don't want someone else uh, to have their hands on. I've had some pretty radical protectionist individuals come up to me in a meeting and start telling me about things that I wrote in an email because they got it from the Fish and Wildlife Service and it was correspondence to them. So be very careful. If, if there's something sensitive, pick up the phone and call someone else and, and talk to them about it. Don't, don't uh, put that stuff in email. So you should know about opportunity costs. Um, every time you do something, you're not doing something else. So keep, when, you, when you get to the end of the day and you say, wow, I don't think I accomplished anything. I've done that hundreds of times. You've got to think to yourself, okay, you didn't, you're busy all day. You didn't seem to accomplish anything. What was it that you were spending your time on? And in a lot of cases these days, people know what those icons are. And this is what I'm talking about. Don't pick up your Instagram account and then all of a sudden 45 minutes you, you like snap out of it like you've just been abducted by an alien and sucked into the, um, the after 45 minutes. Be conscious about where you're spending your time because everything you're doing better be value added and, and beneficial or a lot of that stuff can be done later for sure. And lastly, about jargon. It drives me crazy when someone stands up in the front of the room and they're an expert in some portion of their, uh, some portion of their profession. And they have all these jargony technical terms for what they're really familiar with. And they're talking to the general public and they're using all these big technical terms as if they were, as if someone else is gonna understand what you're talking about. And I see that mostly in insecure people that feel like they need to use big words so that everybody will think they're smart. But I've got news for you. If you give a talk and you've got too much technical jargon in there, people are just going to turn off and they're not going to listen. And at the end of your talk, they're not going to think you're very smart because they didn't really understand what you were talking about. And you sure didn't convey any message to them. Whereas if you speak to them about something technical in eighth grade kind of uh, language, that doesn't mean you're dumbing it down because they're dumb. It just means you're being respectful and you're speaking in a way that they can easily understand it. So as I have here, too often you utilize sizable words when a diminutive one will suffice. But we all know what that means. We know those, what those words mean, but it's pretty clunky and awkward to read that and to listen to someone talk like that. So speak in common language. It doesn't mean you're dumb. It means that when you get done speaking, the audience is gonna think you're really smart because they understood exactly what you're doing for your research. And they understood all that and, they're, and they'll be pretty impressed if you just um, communicate to them instead of talk at them. Okay, now I have a, a series of things that I think are things that are changing in the conservation landscape, uh, challenges for the future, opportunities for the future. Some things are not necessarily bad or good. They're just things that are changing and things to, to be aware of. One is uh, increasing public engagement. We, we absolutely have a more informed public. Um, the public has is, is got tons of information they have access to. A lot of the public now have master's degrees and PhDs in, in maybe wildlife, natural related, natural resources related fields. They may be coming to your public meetings with some really good information. They may be citing scientific papers. Um, so this increasing public engagement is a good thing. We want people engaged in conservation and advocating for conservation, but gone are the days where we got a wildlife degree and now we work for an agency and we're the experts and everybody else is just the general public. Um, that's not the landscape anymore. We're, we're in a landscape where everybody is much better informed and that comes with some good and, and with some bad. Also, I think uh, one thing that's changed since, since I was at point is, is more and more people trying to force a dichotomy between people who love nature and love the outdoors and hunting. I, I had a book chapter that I wrote and it went out for review and one of the reviewers was a professor at a small university in the east and he taught wildlife classes and he said in his comments in his comments he mentioned hunters uh, versus conservationists he put those two things in, in opposing um opposing poles and and that really irritated me because we can't keep dividing people who are interested in nature and hunters as if they're as if they're different things and you see people purposely doing that and you just see a lot of our media kind of forcing people to think that way, that there's the nasty old hunters, and then there's these conservationists that are doing uh, good things. And we need to fight against that. Conservation in the future is gonna take everybody working together, and we can't be dividing people up like that. The, as some people say, the greenies and the brownies. 
the greeny environmentalists and the brownies, the hunters, we're, we're all in the same tent. The moat is around all of us and we need to protect conservation and protect wild things and wild places by working together, not by trying to send a divide up and create these false dichotomies. One thing we're gonna to have to deal with is a general rise in empathy for individuals in the general public. There's no way to stop it. It's just, uh, it, is, it is what it is. But people now are very empathetic and very worried about the welfare of an individual rather than the health of a population. So it used to be the biologists could just say, well, we're interested in the health of, of wildlife populations and the health of ecosystems. And that always comes at the expense of individuals. Individuals have to die. A lot of individuals have to die for ecosystems to be healthy, for populations to be healthy. And we always, as biologists, kind of rested on that and said, we're not gonna go out and save that individual animal. But the public now is pretty much demanding a lot of it's because of some of the TV shows where they're always rescuing animals, but the public's demanding that we worry about individuals and individuals are important. And so this is just something that our profession is gonna to have to deal with, this rising empathy for individuals when we're trying to manage populations. And sometimes the population's overcarrying capacity, we affect management changes to kill a whole bunch of animals to get that population healthy and get that habitat healthy. And, and that's wildlife management. The public sometimes um, is worried about individuals uh, as much or more than, than population, we're just going to have to deal with that. Okay, the North American model of wildlife conservation is absolutely the most successful paradigm for conservation anyone's developed anywhere on the globe uh, at any time. And hunters were a huge cornerstone for the history of the North American model, but they're not necessarily going to be the only um, participants in the future of the North American model. That, that model has to be made more inclusive. And when we talk about inclusivity, we're talking about race and we're talking about gender, but we're also talking about the, the skinny white guy with the big beard and the black rim glasses with no lenses in them, um, who never grew up, he grew up in a big city, never had any exposure to firearms, never had any exposure to hunting, doesn't even know anybody, he can even ask anything about, about hunting, but he's really interested in this concept of deer being overpopulated and, and not being good for the local forest, and the idea of him maybe going out and himself harvesting one of those overpopulated deer and having free range natural organic meat to eat locally sourced and, and not seeing the inside of some factory farming situation. There's a lot of people, a growing number of people that are really kind of interested in that concept. And we need to embrace all of those people. And so when we talk about diversity and, and inclusiveness, we're talking about race, gender, but we're talking about urbanites, we're talking about local voters, we're talking about people that are interested in local sourcing their vegetables and, and their meat. And the North American model has to adapt and continue to evolve with these, these societal changes. Also, 95% of Americans that don't hunt have to see the 5% that hunt as a positive force for conservation. And, and I talk about this a lot of times. If we in the Arizona Game and Fish Department do a Facebook post on Mexican wolf recovery, you can look at your watch and, and it's just a matter of a few minutes when a hunter will get on there and say, cute shovel and shut up, smoke a pack a day, what good are wolves, um, kill them all. And I usually, when we post something on wolves, I work with our social media people and I'm usually there and engaged with the comments. And so I'll, I'll um, jump in just as an individual, not as an official department person and, and say this and say, well, what you just said in the public forum is exactly what anti-hunting groups want hunters to look like in the public. But the reality is you're 5% of the population or we're 5% of the population as hunters. The other 95% of the population, a lot of those people like the idea of recovering wolves. And so you really want to position yourself on the opposite side of 95% of the, of the non-hunting public. And when we do surveys, we find 77 to 81% of the public supports legal ethical hunting. So we have this huge portion of those 95% that support what we do, but they only support what we do if they see us as uh, over in the positive column when it comes to conservation. The once the minute we start saying we don't want to recover wolves because they eat the deer and then we're going to have less deer tag, then then you're doing more damage for the future of hunting and the future of conservation than any anti-hunting group could possibly do. Uh, lastly, I see I see this growing issue of protectionist groups, protectionist individuals. A couple um, that are in academia, a couple that are becoming more well-known professors, and they're publishing peer-reviewed papers talking about 
how bad hunting is just because they personally don't like hunting. And so they use their professional and professor position to write a paper and they get it passed through the peer reviewed literature and they get it published in sometimes major journals, sometimes nature and science. We've got these anti-hunting articles by protectionist um, people and it looks like science and it looks like someone with a, a, a good valid point about why hunting is bad and it's not. Their, their arguments are flawed but they still get it in the literature and that gets um, that gets cited. I see that in wolves too. There's some pretty well-known professors and geneticists. They're advocating for the wrong thing when it comes to wolf recovery and wolf delisting, and yet they have a lot of credibility, and they're publishing in the scientific literature. And so this goes back to being skeptical. There is a lot of junk in in the peer-reviewed literature, and so make sure that you're evaluating that and you're skeptical of, of things that are, are published and, and where they're coming from. Okay, lastly. Um, a couple tips for the future for being successful, mostly geared towards the students that are, are watching. Um, three R's, read, write, relationships. So read a lot. You have to read stuff to know stuff. And you learn a lot by reading. So make sure you're reading everything you can, and that doesn't mean scrolling Instagram and um, watching TikTok videos. It means, it means reading knowledge of, of reliable knowledge about the, the profession. Write means do everything that, that's right. You might be tempted in some some cases to cut some corners and and um, maybe do something that's not completely right. But you've got to stay on the straight. I'll always do the right thing. And relationships. Remember the slide with me and Paco and Alejandro and, and Enrique. Relationships really make things happen. We, uh, as an example, our our local Arizona Game and Fish regional supervisor had a brilliant idea years ago, and he had a, he, he convened an annual meeting with. Arizona Game and Fish, Bureau of Land Management and Forest Service in southeastern Arizona. And the meeting wasn't in someone's conference room from 8 in the morning to 5 at night. The meeting was from noon one day to noon the next day. And it was always held in some remote ranch or remote wildlife area or remote uh, X ranger station that usually didn't have uh, internet, usually didn't have cell service. So we would drive there in the morning. We'd start to we'd bring lawn chairs. And the rule was no logos. You had to be in plain clothes. So we didn't sit there with our team uniforms, Forest Service versus Bureau of Land Management. We, we were all there in plain clothes, sitting with our water bottles on a lawn chair. And if the meeting started at noon to five, the meeting, um, the first part of the meeting ended at five, we would all get together and we would start preparing salads and we'd barbecue um, ribs or brisket or fajitas and a bunch of beer came out and we would sit around the campfire, poker games would break out and we would all be together just around a campfire and having fun and enjoying some beverages. And then in the morning, um, we'd get up eight o'clock, pull your lawn chairs out on the lawn again, and we meet from eight until noon, everybody would be at noon. I can't tell you how much that, just that one annual meeting fostered camaraderie and friendships among our agencies. And when things got kind of tight, when one agency was suing another agency, we could call up our friend in that other agency and say, you know, I know our agencies are doing this stuff way above us, um, but, but you know we can still work together. You have this friendly relationship with, with that person. That's important, and that's all related to the three C's: collaboration and, and cooperation, and colleagues. You, you really, I learned later in my career, collaborating and cooperating with other people, you can do so much better and do so much more work. Early in my career, I had my to-do list. I was a workaholic, and I just know to the grindstone. I did my stuff. Later, I learned that when you start developing this network and developing relationships you can accomplish 10 times more with just a couple more people um, helping out and, and working on. So the three P's, I have a friend that uh, his mantra for hunting is the three P's, patience, perseverance, and a positive mental attitude. But in the work environment, I, I don't have a lot of patience for the word patience. I want to get some stuff done. So I replace that with progress. So make progress, keep your eye on the, on the finish line and make sure that you're thinking about when you're getting something done. You're not just working on it. Persevere. I have a little tolerance for people that say, well, I called them and I left a message four days ago and I didn't hear back. Well, you're not trying very hard. I mean, persevere to get stuff done, to, to contact that person you need to contact in, in that example. And a positive mental attitude. You know, your attitude is your theme song for your life. And the great thing is you get to pick your theme song. Are you going to have this theme song as a foreboding, negative, horror movie theme song that something bad's about to happen? Or are you going to pick a theme song that's more like an action movie and it's upbeat and it's positive. You get to choose your theme song for your life and that's your attitude. 
So to have a positive attitude and, and it's gonna make everything, work and uh, home, a lot, uh, a lot easier and a lot better. And finally, the three W's, work harder. I know someone that sell t-shirts that says, no one cares, work harder. And I love that because it's true. I don't care about excuses. I don't care about what obstacles you have. Figure it out, make it happen. Figure out how to make it happen and work harder and, and get it done. Um, worry less. Now there's, you, you talk about working harder and working harder and doing extra work. There are times where you have deadlines and they're just overwhelming. There's no way you're gonna get all that done by all those deadlines. But just remember, if you have everything on your to-do list, you're looking at your calendar, you know when the deadlines are, you have everything prioritized, you work things in priority order, you do the most important things first, you can only do what you can do. And that's been a mantra that has helped me a lot. I've said, I've said many times, well, I can only do what I can do. I'm working hard. And the thing is, it always works out. When you think there's no way I'm gonna meet all these deadlines, you just work hard, you do the most important things. I've never had it not work out where someone didn't say, well, it's not that important. Why don't you get that to me next week or something? It always works out. So just, just remember, you can only do what you can do. And then lastly, write. I, if you write, you learn so much. I, I wrote a book on deer not because I'm a deer expert, not because I was a deer expert, but I, I really became a deer expert because I wrote a book on deer. So when you write stuff, you have to have it right. You have to do some research and the act of writing really increases your knowledge. And then when you publish that stuff, people see that you have that knowledge and that is just really an enabler and a catalyst to uh, your career, to getting, getting things done. So uh, thanks, good luck. You can find me on Instagram if, uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, the take home message here is uh, again, if, if you're thinking, well, I'm not the top of my class, um, I don't really feel like a rock star in college. It just takes hard work and determination and perseverance. And if you want to go places, um, you, you can absolutely go places. And, and I'm probably proof of that. And tell your folks I said hi. And if nobody has questions, I have some questions. I'm going to call on people individually. I'm going to unmute them as the host. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, thank you very much, Jim. That was a wonderful presentation. Some great advice there. I I had to write them down because I'm like, I can actually use this. I need to <laughs> I need to be thinking about these things moving forward. I see a collection of questions on the North American model uh, or comments and. I might just kind of pull them together and you commented about how we need to move forward with the North American model of wildlife conservation. Um, in what directions do you see it most likely going or perhaps where does it need to most go? Yeah, if someone's interested in that topic, there's a new book that was co-edited by Val Geis and, and Shane Mahoney just in the last year on the North American model. And you, you can find that on Amazon and it has a couple chapters about moving forward and how we need to evolve in, in the future. North American model served us really well up until this point, and, and the foundation of it is gonna serve us really well in the future, but we can't just keep saying hunters are the source of conservation um, because there's a whole bunch of conservation going on out there that may not be related to hunters. And so we have to acknowledge that. And I, I think the biggest thing is we that are, that are maybe in the hunting community and we that are talking mostly about the North American model need to all individually start talking more broadly that this isn't just something that um, hunters are delivering to everybody. It's something that kind of came through the consumptive wildlife and the hunting community, but now we need to open our arms, broaden the tent and, and include so many more people and be open to um, the idea of some urbanite um, who's got, um, maybe not look like us and, and encourage them and do whatever we can with state programs to get people who are adults and have no experience in hunting but are interested in it. I think that's the biggest thing is that we need to help those people that didn't come through hunter education when they were 10 years old. And now they're 30 years old and they, they're curious. And I think we need to find programs to help. And, and there are programs out there, but we need to encourage those programs to get those people involved. We need them. All of the old white guys with gray hair are gonna die off in a, in a decade or so. And, and we need this foundation of, of conservation support. <laughs> Shelly, did you have any more queued up? Yeah, um, 
Jessica asked, has there ever been something or an event that has set you back from a goal you wanted to achieve and how did you overcome it? Good question. Yes, um, I think probably the, the best advantage, the best uh, example is in some of my Mexican wolf, wolf recovery work, there's been a lot of times where people, we've been moving in a certain direction that was gonna be successful and someone either politically put a roadblock in the way or published a scientific paper that, that, um, that contradicted the direction we had to go. And so we had to stop and regroup and, and basically write a, a rebuttal of that paper and write a scientific paper to support what we were trying to do as, as the proper way to recover, recover wolves. So it's been, it, there's been several times where we get these setbacks, maybe get, back, get a judge decision and then get set back and we just have to regroup, um, but it, it's all really based on regrouping, going back to the science and providing a scientific foundation to explain why they're wrong or explain why we're moving forward in, in the way that we are. If you come back with a scientific foundation, there's not a lot of people that can, uh, can, can knock you off of that. Yeah, I've seen all of your bottles and uh, you know all about Mexican wolf genetics and and then just what is it last month or yeah last month you guys published the the habitat suitability model for Mexican wolves to um, to include so much of the the habitat in Mexico proper, um, mm -hmm. which I think you know is just again re refuting what some people say based upon the science that you're coming up with. Yeah, with Mexican wolves, there's a, a group, um, I don't want to call them the Mexican wolf mafia, but there's a group that are very anti-Mexico. They want all Mexican wolf recovery in the United States, in Colorado and Utah, even though they were never there. And they want to ignore Mexico, and yet the country of Mexico is 90% of the historical range of the Mexican wolf. And so they have these convoluted arguments about why it all needs to be done in the U.S. And all the protectionist environmental groups are all behind them because they want 100% control over Mexican wolf recovery in the US and they don't have any control in Mexico. But the truth is that US Fish and Wildlife Service and Arizona Game and Fish, we we have binational recovery plans for ocelots and black-footed ferrets and jaguars and and um, um, pronghorn and condors. I mean, all kinds of species that we have successful binational plans for. But with wolves, wolves are such a different thing for some people. They don't want to trust our Mexican colleagues with any recovery. They want to do it all in the U.S. And that's un unfair. And I think it's insulting to, to all the work that we're doing in Mexico. We have a comment here from Noah, uh, who identifies the, uh, the 10 half a finger commandments. And uh, yeah, I saw that pop up. I'm going to expand from that and, and say, how did you make the transition from a dirt field biologist to a career counselor? Yes, it, it, and that's an interesting question because it, all of my years in uh, as a regional biologist, I, I was adjunct professor at the university. I sat on master's committees and, and I um, guest lectured in classes, but I didn't mentor students a lot. And just in the last five years when I, I moved my office to campus and, and we have a, a program called a university liaison position where I'm actually a liaison, a, an official game and fish liaison with the university. And we have other people for the other two universities. And so it's kind of formalized, but there's um, there's no extra money involved. It's just something that, again, you take on extra. And it wasn't until I got my office on campus and I had office hours and had students start coming in and discussing what they want to do for a living that I started working with students. And I was actually shocked. I shocked myself at how rewarding that was. I just didn't think of that in the past. Students, you know, I talked to students here and there at check stations and things when they were volunteering, but I found it incredibly rewarding to have a conversation with a student and have them leave feeling like, wow, that was really helpful. No one else has talked to me about those sorts of things. And, 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 and that, that really makes me feel good. And so it's really in the last part of my career that I've enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed that. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's such a... Yeah, we're, I'm very, very fortunate. It's the way I feel about my career also. Um, exactly that. Um, what, and there was a question. Um, what was it like to, to meet Ranella? <laughs> he, what is he like? In, what is he really like in person? He, he, 
when you see him on TV and when you see him on the podcast, I mean that's that's him. Uh, he doesn't he, he doesn't put on a show, and you can kind of tell that if you spend any time um, watching him at all. But he's a pretty interesting person because he's pretty well read, and he will prepare for an interview. And when we did two and a half hours of talks from Neanderthals to Deer Evolution, it was like rapid fire. He had all kinds of questions that he was interested in. And, um, I couldn't wait to get home and, and listen to that podcast to see where I screwed up and I'm pretty happy that pretty happy that I, I only said a few little dumb things that weren't that consequential. But um, he's a pretty interesting person, along with the whole media crew. Very good. Uh, Jennifer, is there anything else we need to do here? To I, I think is that do we get all the questions, Scott? There is there was one more little question in here that says, uh, I think this is from Joey. He says, okay, you like mammals, not a fan of birds, but where do you stand with herps? Herps, well, you saw some of the pictures, right? Yeah. Snakes around my neck and say, I, I've always been a, a fan of snakes and had, had ball pythons and, and had some, some other snakes. And, and Shelly may be exaggerating my snake handling and, and wrangling skills. The snake that I found in my living room last night was about five inches long not as big around as a pencil and um it, it was venomous actually it's a night snake and so technically it's rear fang venomous but the venom is so weak it's for little tiny lizards and things that he his fangs wouldn't even be able to get through my epidermis he was a tiny <laughs> Very good. Well, Jim, I can't thank you enough for being willing to do this. And this is like our, this is the way we're kicking off our, our alumni uh, colloquium. So it's like, um, at the, I just, you know, I'm, I'm biased. I'm a wildlifer. Um, but I, I do feel like the, the advice you gave to our students was, was just, you know, spot on. Um, Will Smith, of course, you can ask a question out loud. You are being recorded, though, so keep that in mind. Thank you for doing that, um, sure. and, and thank you for presenting, Jim. It, it's it's great. Um, so I suppose my question was about the um, the rise in the empathy of individuals, and you know the public concern for individuals. Um, is anybody um, like in conservation thinking about like going on? or trying to like talk to the media, get on news, trying to spread more awareness about population control. Cause like, I kind of get where people are coming from. I would never be able to take a life away. It's against my beliefs, but I understand the need for population control. So like, is, is that being talked about more about how to counteract that public opinion? I'm not sure there's any new groundswell of talk um, about that. Shane Mahoney talks pretty eloquently about this rise in empathy and, and how it conflicts with us maintaining uh, maintaining populations. But like I mentioned, we've got 77 to 81 percent of the public that supports hunting, and and that's it's because of that. I think people realize that hunting is the, is the most effective agent for population control. But we don't. Hunting isn't justified just because oh we need to kill them or they're going to overpopulate and they starve to death. I mean we know it's more complicated than that. If it was that, why why are we hunting black bears and why are we hunting mountain lions? It's a much bigger conservation engine that all of this uh, all of this contributes to. And I don't, I don't know if there's anything that people are really working on that, but biologists in general have always been talking about that, been talking about properly managing population in in relation to the available habitat. So. Um, I think that that will continue. And um, someone like you with your unique perspective is probably uniquely positioned to probably provide messaging, more effective messaging um, to, to other people that feel like you do about the importance of population control and that it may, it may be seen as a necessary evil. Um, if, when I cook a whitetail backstrap on mesquite coals, I don't think of it as an evil, um, but other people may say, I don't really like that. Um, but I understand that it, it's necessary in a lot of cases. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.